What is up, everybody? Welcome into another edition of the Two Stripes Podcast, the 25th episode of the Two Stripes Podcast. My name is Colton Denning. I want to thank you for joining the show. It is Sunday, June 4th, 2017. And I'm on location in beautiful Boulder, Colorado. Hope you all had a great weekend and they're off to a good start to your week. Like I said, 25th episode of the show. I think I've been around for about just over a year now doing the podcast. So I want to thank everybody who's contributed over the past year, the first couple episodes. My buddy Denver Powell, of course, co-hosted with me. Hope to have him back on during the season for a couple of spot shows. And a huge thank you to everybody that has listened over the past year. You guys are the most important component to the success of this show and look forward to hopefully getting many more episodes out of this podcast and can't wait for the 2017 season to start to kind of see where we go with this thing. But thank you to everybody that's listened. And if you want to go back and listen to any old episodes, Head on over to soundcloud.com slash two stripes pod or search the two stripes podcast on iTunes. Getting into today's episode, last Thursday I had the opportunity to speak with one of the contributors for tarheelblog.com, Jay Exum, about the North Carolina Tar Heels in the 2017 season. The most notable thing about North Carolina last season, probably to most casual college football fans, was the quarterback, Mitch Trubisky, who ended up being the second overall pick in this year's draft to the Chicago Bears. He, of course, is out of the mix, but maybe the main storyline for the Tar Heels this year is not only the loss of Trubisky in replacing what he did at quarterback, but offensive production lost as a whole. Coming into this season, North Carolina is 128th out of 129 Division I teams in returning offensive experience. They lose their top two running backs from last season and 400 rushing yards from Trubisky. They lose three of their top four targets in the receiving game. And there's going to be a lot of new faces on that North Carolina offense. So that's definitely the biggest question mark for this year's Tar Heels team. And in that same vein, offensively, quarterback Brandon Harris transfers over from LSU. If you know anything about Harris, he was one of the more highly touted recruits coming out of high school in his class. And he was a guy that I followed pretty closely because Ohio State was in on him during his recruitment. And when he went to LSU, I remember thinking that it was a weird fit, LSU and Les Miles at the time didn't have the reputation of exactly developing quarterbacks and getting strong quarterback play. So it seemed kind of like an odd fit, even though he was a Louisiana kid. But for whatever reason, it just never ended up working out. And he transferred out of the program and now finds himself at North Carolina under Larry Fedora and in that offensive system. And so Jay and I talked a lot about Brandon Harris and how he might fit into that system we also talked about replacing all that other offensive production and who some of the names to watch for are in that offense this year and then flipped over to the defense and the defense loses a big name in coordinator Gene Chizik deciding to step down and spend more time with his family you got a new face in John Papuchas who was the linebackers coach the last two seasons so we discussed a little bit about kind of what they're going to do schematically whether they'll change anything or just keep everything kind of the same with what they do defensively and then of course with what we do in all of these season previews we broke down the outlook for the 2017 season and why despite all the losses there's still optimism in the unc program and how much coach larry fedora plays into that his offensive system almost being a plug and play with quarterbacks and being able to generate yardage and points and then playing in the coastal there isn't an FSU to worry about there isn't Clemson there isn't Louisville there isn't that one dominant team that is going to run away with it and given that Virginia Tech also has their own personnel issues from players leaving last season their status as a defending champion of the coastal division I think is also in question heading into 2017 so Spent some time talking about the outlook for this season and where the program stands. So that's enough of me flapping my beak about it. You might as well hear it from Jay Exum and 
Take a listen to his thoughts on the 2017 North Carolina Tar Heels. So to talk everything North Carolina football, I am joined on the podcast by one of the staff writers for TarHeelBlog.com, Jay Exum. Jay, what's happening, man? How you doing? I'm doing great, Colton. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you for joining the show. And usually whenever I do these episodes, especially when it comes to previewing a team before the season, I feel like the first thing I always want to know about is the trajectory of a program or where a program's been in the last three or four years. And in watching North Carolina from afar, it seems like they've done a really good job of building a solid foundation with Larry Fedora as a head coach. How would you assess how his tenure has gone in Chapel Hill so far? Well, I I would say there's sort of uh, among the fan base, it's, it's mostly positive, but with some mixed reviews. Some of that Uh, I think it's fair and some of it's unfair. But what he has done is establish what looks something like a eight or so win type team on a fairly regular basis. That's not to say uh, that it would never go less than that. And this year could potentially be one of those years. But at North Carolina, eight wins a year as kind of an expectation is not, you know, something that can be taken for granted. Uh, it's a it's a fairly big deal. And the, the thing that gets lost is that due to no fault of his own, he took over at North Carolina in the midst of an NCAA firestorm that he had nothing to do with, has no control over, and has had to recruit through the whole time he's been there. So given what could have been happened with all of that going on. I think he has uh, performed remarkably well, and and I am uh, a Larry Fedora fan. Uh, And of course, two seasons ago, when uh, Carolina was in the ACC championship, you know, he was the toast of the town. We had not contended for an ACC championship, and, and really we were sort of a dark horse to even get in the playoff that year. That was just something that hadn't been seen in a very, very long time in North Carolina. But Every time you do that, expectations start to rise, and expectations were very high last season. Um, as most even casual fans know, we had Mitch Trubisky at quarterback, who ended up being the number two pick in the draft. Uh, we had a lot of other offensive weapons, and the expectations were that we would have a year very much like the prior year, and it didn't work out that way. It, it, they ended up as an eight-win team uh, with a couple of bad losses along the way. They lost a game to Duke that they really had no business losing. They lost winnable games uh, against Georgia, NC State, although State won that game fairly thoroughly. Uh, And even the Stanford game, they had a a chance to win uh, right there at the end. But I would say if you look at the big picture, when North Carolina wins eight games and people are sort of annoyed and complaining, that means you've taken the program from a, a place where, you know, five to seven wins was sort of okay to a place where expectations are rising. And that means, means things are going in a good direction. Do you think, too, that along with that 11-3 and three season a couple of years ago, coupled with the view, and I don't know if North Carolina fans think this, but in season previews it always seems like people say North Carolina is a sleeping giant. And do you think that those two things coupled together – especially for last year, kind of set up some unfair expectations for their football program, not only this past season, but in the years to come. The sleeping giant thing, I, I've been a, I've been a North Carolina football fan for almost 40 years, and the sleeping giant thing has been around for most of that. And it's almost like the Charlie Brown kicking the football <laughs> and Lucy taking it away in the fall every year. Um, people are almost afraid to develop hope. So they, there's almost an extra little bit of anger after there's that 11-win season, and then you don't repeat that. It's sort of, oh, no, here we go again. I don't want to get my heart broken again. But I don't think that the expectations of last year's team were unrealistic. I, I do think that last year's team uh, – I, I, I suspect that even Larry Fedora would say – Uh, Last year's team did not perform at the level that they uh, had expected at the beginning. And one of the big reasons is every coach's least sympathetic reason, uh, which is that they just were ravaged on the offensive line. You know, when people play uh, NCAA on their Xbox or whatever, uh, if an offensive lineman goes down in your video game, you just keep playing. 
you know, it's whatever, plug another big guy in. That's not how it works in the real world. Yeah. And so th they were dealing with, with people playing out of position. They were dealing with people who they had no intention of putting on the line. And that just kind of messes everything else up. And then later in the season, they lost their best speed receiver, Mac Hollins, who's now on the Philadelphia Eagles. And that made it a lot harder to spread defenses out and get guys open underneath, um, which is especially important if you're having a little bit of trouble uh, moving a defensive line, which which was uh, certainly an issue. So I don't think uh, anyone wants to make excuses because injuries are part of football. And as soon as you say something like that, someone responds, well, yeah, everybody has injuries in football. And, and, and that's true. But I, I do think they had them concentrated in a place where they, they just couldn't uh, afford as much loss as they as, as they had. So uh, I, I don't think for last season the expectations were wrong. Uh, I just think things didn't go the way they wanted, and that just happens sometimes. Now, for the coming season, I think there's a chance that exactly the opposite thing is going to play out. We lost so many name guys from what had been for years an elite offense, not only Trubisky, uh, but Mac Hollins and Elijah Hood, Ryan Switzer, a lot of really elite offensive talent. And overall, uh, I believe it was uh, something like nine of 11 starters are no longer with the program. And what people tend to do when they look at that is say, well, uh, only two returning starters. There's no way they can keep up, especially for a team that's not known for having especially strong defense. So if the offense is decimated by departures and we have the same kind of defense that we've had over the last several years, that seems to not look very good. And a lot of people have predicted a sort of five, six-ish kind of win season, which my guess is is a little low. Yeah, and to get into that, and I read something that, uh, that you wrote about Brandon Harris a couple of months ago that we'll get into and been reading a little bit on Tar Heel blog about thoughts about the offense in all of those players leaving, and there's been a lot of optimism despite all of that production gone. Do you think that most of that is because of what Larry Fedora has been able to do offensively, basically wherever he's been? And even, you know, they've had, what, three or four quarterbacks since he's been at North Carolina, and basically every single season they've had a top 30 passing offense. One, do you think at this point it's kind of plug-and-play for whoever the quarterback is of that passing game? And do you think also, too, that being in the Coastal Division kind of plays into that as well, that, hey, you know, we may lose a bunch of players, but there's no FSU, there's no Clemson, and there's no Louisville. There's not really a dominant team to kind of run away or two or three like in the Atlantic's case. Do you think that both of those factors kind of play into why people like you and other Tar Heel fans are maybe more optimistic despite those personnel losses? Yeah, and, and I would I would say it's a little bit deeper than just plug and play, but, it, but, but it's absolutely the case that – Larry Fedora has produced offense everywhere he's ever been. And I would not bet against him finding a way to produce it with whatever he has on hand in any given year. That said, uh, I think it's fair to say that the North Carolina coaching staff really was not comfortable with what they have had, I should say, on the, on the existing roster before Brandon Harris came on board. Not because they don't think those guys are good, but because they're they're just not quite ready for for prime time yet. So when Harris signed up, I mean there is a question mark there. He did not put up the most impressive statistics in the world at LSU, but he's completely changing offenses and he reminds a lot of people of Marquise Williams who was very successful at North Carolina. But even though it was a different system, he has three full years of SEC-level football. There's not going to be a defense he hasn't seen before. There are not going to be athletes who scare him. And I think in his case, there may be more plug-and-play than there would be if, for example, the starting quarterback were Nathan Elliott, who is probably the guy who would come in off the bench if Harris gets hurt or, or, or doesn't perform. But, but yes, I think, I think that's uh, a big factor. Uh, as, as far as the Coastal goes, I, I, I find the Coastal very difficult to predict year to year, but it's certainly fair to say no Florida State, uh, no Clemson. That's the more favorable side of, uh, of the ACC, at least right now in football terms. So that helps too. 
the, the, the team that won last season was Virginia Tech, and they lost, they lost an awful lot also. And I don't think there's any reason to assume that they'll necessarily repeat. I don't think the Coastals had a repeat winner in quite some time. So you brought up Brandon Harris, and let's get into him in that offense. We've talked a little bit about the production. In terms of the raw numbers, North Carolina only returning 19% of their production. That's good for second to last nationally in the country. And at quarterback, Mitch Trubisky gone, headed off to the Bears. And you mentioned Brandon Harris. And Harris was a kid that I watched really closely during his recruitment because Ohio State was in on him along with LSU, who he eventually ended up committing to. And it kind of seemed like at the time he was almost a can't-miss prospect. And if you watched any of LSU, I feel like it was baffling to see him play the way he did. So how did he look in, in the limited time that he's been on campus so far? And what do you think a fair expectation is for Harris this season? Well, um, there, it's very difficult to answer your first question because he – only recently, like in the last couple of weeks, arrived on campus. He was not on campus for spring practice. Uh, so the the quarterbacks that most people expect to be reserves were, were doing all that. So we haven't seen him in live game conditions. But for what it's worth, the things people seem to be saying from what his workouts with the receivers uh, have been in kind of non-pad conditions have been good. Uh, I, I do think one of the interesting things to think about with a guy like Brandon Harris, and this is true with respect to to a lot of guys who, who go the grad transfer route, how different recruitment is at that level than it is when, when you're you know a, a high schooler or not used to that kind of attention and it, all these guys that you've seen on TV are calling you on the phone. You know, Harris is a Louisiana kid, and uh, the pull of LSU just by being LSU has to be huge. And they don't lose a lot of guys out of Louisiana, in part, I think, because – they don't ask a lot of questions. LSU came calling. I'm a really good football player. Why wouldn't I go there? Absolutely. And there are some answers to that question. And in the case of LSU, it's because this is the Leonard Fournette offense. We're going to try to pound people with a run and occasionally let you throw the ball deep downfield. That may or may not fit your skill set very well. When he decided to uh, leave LSU and go somewhere else, I think, he looked at North Carolina and saw an offense that would allow him to show more of what he could do. I, I don't, I, I doubt, I don't have any reason to think he grew up a Carolina fan or that there was, you know, some special end that he had, but I think he made a business decision. And I think that decision uh, may or may not play out well. well. We'll have to see, but I don't necessarily think that there's any reason to expect that, uh, his performance at LSU will correlate very strongly to what happens at, at North Carolina. He will, he will be playing almost a different position. Looking at some of the weapons he might have at receiver, North Carolina loses three of their top four targets from last year in Ryan Switzer, Bug Howard, and TJ Logan out of the backfield. Austin Prohl is back for his senior season, but who else are some names to watch out for and who do you think will step up in those roles? Well, at the outset, there's a, there's a guy named Thomas Jackson who started as a walk-on, and I think he's now a scholarship player, who really performed well last year. I don't think he's going to be an elite receiver. Another story like that was Mac Hollins. Mac Hollins became, I think, at least by ACC standards, an elite receiver. I don't think Jackson has that kind of upside, but I do think he'll see meaningful minutes. There's a guy named uh, Jordan Cunningham, who's a transfer from Vanderbilt, who's who came in with a lot of accolades. So far, he's he's had a you know a, a few big plays. He was a big name recruit, uh, hasn't quite played to the big name recruit level, but now he's a fifth year senior, and this is an opportunity for him to to step up. There is maybe the fastest guy on the team is a guy named Anthony Ratliff. He uh, sometimes goes by Anthony Ratliff Williams. He changes that back and forth. He's probably the fastest player on the team. He does some kick returning, but he was a quarterback in high school and is adjusting to the wide receiver position. So he, he's not yet a sharp route runner, but all the athleticism is, is there. And if he, if he learns to get off cornerbacks and you know, find space and stretch the field, uh, he could kind of fill that Mac Hollins role. I guess a couple of the names I would throw in are, are J.T. Cawthon. He is a freshman, very highly rated. There was a kid named Josh Cabrera who was a, a solid but not sort of elite-level recruit that most people are saying has 
performed in excess of his reputation and, and is expected to make contributions. So those are some of the names you might start to see in the season to come. And it just feels like North Carolina for the past decade, whether it's Hakeem Nix, uh, Quinshaw Davis had some pretty prolific seasons, Eric Ebron at tight end, and the three guys last year, especially Switzer and Bug Howard. It feels like North Carolina always has a receiver option and somebody to step up and not only be just a decent receiver, but a pretty good one too. Yeah, they've had more than their fair share of good receivers and good quarterbacks over the last 10 years or so. And for very long stretches of time uh, at North Carolina before that, that really wasn't the case. You, you didn't see Hakeem Nix type players during the Mac Brown era. That was mostly a defensive oriented team, even his best teams. So yeah, I, I do think that's true. And, and, you, and you mentioned Eric Ebron, one of the key receivers this season is going to be Brandon Fritz, who uh, actually went to the same high school, uh, I believe, as Mitch Trubisky. Uh, he's a big target. He's had some injury issues his first two years. But if he is healthy, I wouldn't be surprised to see him kind of become that sort of stereotypical tight end safety blanket for Brandon Harris or whoever is manning the quarterback position. Dwight Jones was another one of those dudes, too. I forgot about him. 2011-10. He was, he was a good receiver. North Carolina, now that I'm looking at it, like – they may not be wide receiver you, but man, these are some very prolific guys. So I, I'm excited to see what they kind of got with this new blood. Yeah, yeah, they've got, you know, they, they usually have a big go up and get it guy, a speed guy, and then somebody who's kind of versatile. And they seem to consistently sort out who, who that's going to be. So, you know, again, the default reaction is, well, if we don't have all the answers to who's going to be great right now, then everyone sort of just defaults to, well, we must not have good players. And I don't think that's going to be true. Uh, I, I think the receivers will be just fine. I think the, the weaker spot is going to be at running back. I don't think that they were planning on losing Elijah Hood in particular. They do have some uh, fresh talent there, but that is, I think, a much bigger question mark than, than the wide receiver position. Shifting into the running game, the top two from last year in Elijah Hood and TJ Logan are gone. And North Carolina also loses 440 yards that Mitch Trubisky rushed for. So looking at the outlook at running back, a guy like Jordan Brown didn't get a ton of work as a freshman last season, and a guy that's been generating some buzz in spring ball was Michael Carter, an all-purpose back from Florida in the 2017 class. What's the outlook for North Carolina at running back heading into the season? I think that's the big question mark. You know, Carter does have a good reputation. None of, neither of those backs is a particularly big guy. You know, we'll see. Uh, Carter has some injury issues in the spring, did show some flashes. There were good reports out of practice, so there's some optimism there. But uh, he's a freshman, and although I will say that, it, you know, at running back, to some degree, if you can play, you can play. So it's, it's a place where you might trust a freshman that you, you wouldn't otherwise. But uh, this is another place where the Tar Heels have brought in uh, a grad transfer by the name of Stanton Truitt. Uh, he's coming in from Auburn, and uh, at Auburn was used kind of as a hybrid wide receiver running back. Because North Carolina is short at running back, my guess is that's where he'll get the bulk of his snaps. And I wouldn't be surprised to see him get the bulk of them if he does well out of the gate. Moving over to the defense, Gene Chizik, defensive coordinator last season, steps down, and now John Papuchis takes over. Do you think that there's going to be any change with that defense under Papuchis? Or given that he was already the linebackers coach for the past two seasons, do you think that schematically it's mostly going to stay the same? And how big of a loss is Gene Chizik's departure? I'm a big Gene Chizik fan. He's hard to listen to and not kind of admire him as a guy. He's a good dude, yeah. Yeah, he's a really good guy. And he has an uncommon knack for communicating and teaching. And I think that part of what he did as a defensive coordinator is as good as anybody in the country. He ran a Tampa 2, uh, sort of a bend-don't-break style defense. And Puchas has a reputation for being more aggressive. The question in my mind is how much influence is Fedora going to have on the defense? It was pretty well known that with his first two defensive coordinators, he pretty much turned it over to them and said, run what you want. And when you've got a guy like Gene Chizik back there, there's there's every reason you might want to do that. Fans always want to want the guy who says, I'm going to be more aggressive, I'm going to blitz more, we're going to play more press coverage. You know, that sounds tough and aggressive and, you know, like like we're going for it. That was not what Chizik did. 
and and I, I think that's there are two real reasons for that. I think one is Tampa two's I think kind of what his thing was, but the other thing was that defense was built around the assumption that the Tar Heels had a Ferrari for an offense. So it's not necessary to get a shutout. What's necessary is to make you take a lot of snaps in order to, to score and put the ball in the end zone. And that was a tactic that matched well when the UNC offense was doing well. So I think that remains to be seen. I think that Fedora is comfortable with that philosophy on defense but I also think that that philosophy was dictated by the youth of what they had on defense they didn't want to take a whole lot of chances with guys who were young who didn't respond well when the offense made adjustments didn't quite know what to do and for the first time in a while there is depth and experience on the defensive side of the ball so if Papuchas wants to be more aggressive and wants to be more experimental I think he's got the personnel to do it. There's more talent on that that defense than it gets credit for, in part because it did play that that Tampa two, and in part because before Gene Chizik got there, they put up some of the worst defense that's ever been seen in, at North Carolina, and that's a statement. One of the reasons that I really love college football is that whether it's team wise or just one player, you can have some pretty crazy stats. And last season, North Carolina's defense may have had the most batshit stat of 2016. One interception. One interception last season. It was returned for a touchdown. You might as well make the most of it if you're going to get one. (laughs) Right. You figure, like, even if the defense is worse, even if it's a lot worse, there's no way that they intercept only one pass again. But you brought up how a lot of fans like to hear a defensive coordinator say, oh, we're going to attack, attack, attack. And now with John Papuchas there – I figure that there was probably a lot of talk or questions about attacking the football in the air this spring, was there not? Yes, people people were going to say that until it doesn't happen. <laughs> I really do believe, I mean, I think almost all the analytics that have ever been applied to it will tell you that turnovers are more or less random. There's not that much you can yeah. do to control it. And I don't think that we ended up with one interception because we didn't defend the pass. Well, actually, our corners were pretty good last year. It just is one of those weird things that sometimes happens in football. And, uh, you know, if, if, if it happens again, I'll be, I'll be shocked. Even if our defense is worse, I don't think that'll happen. What do you think is a fair expectation for the defense this year? Uh, I think – That whether this team lives down to, I think, what are some of the two soft expectations of sort of a five, six ish win team or surprises on the upside and has sort of an eight to 10 win season is going to depend on whether the defense can lead early on in the season. They, uh, They open with California. California is a little bit of a question mark because they changed coaches, but last season they were an absolutely hopeless defensive team with a pretty good offense to deal with. So if that offense uh, remains strong uh, and the UNC offense is still in development, uh, the defense is really going to have to uh, step up and lead because we won't be able to win that game just by turning over the keys to the offense and you know watching it go. My hope for the defense is that it, it, that it takes another step forward from, I, I would say that Chiswick's work took the defense from being humiliatingly bad to being competent. For this team to reach its goals next season, I think the defense doesn't have to be great. I do think that Fedora will get the offense going if we keep the injuries to a minimum. But I do think it needs to be good. I do think it needs to... Uh, offer the potential to win a game when the offense isn't doing what it's what it's going to do. So if it can finish, let's say, in the top half of the ACC, maybe even the top third, I think that bodes really well. And I think there's the talent there to do it. That side of the ball, if you, if you look down through the rec- recruiting history and what the, the rankings were, what you, what you will see repeatedly is, oh, okay, well, that guy was just a sophomore, but he, he was a pretty good – a pretty highly rated player. Aaron Crawford's a good example. Jeremiah Clark, Jalen Dalton, uh, Jason uh, Strobridge. The, the, the defensive line should be a strength of the team. Dewan Drennan is a senior. Uh, he was a defensive end was, who was an elite recruit uh, who's, who's had injury problems and barely got to play until the very end of last season because of those injury problems. Up and down the roster, there is talent 
that needs to step forward. There aren't yet the big names. Probably the biggest name on the defense is Andre Smith, uh, a middle linebacker out of Florida. He's a little bit of an undersized guy, but he's got all the aggression in the world and is probably the number one linebacker on the team who might have a chance to play at the next level. I would say that aside from Smith, we're still in wait-and-see mode on the rest of the linebacking core. Again, this is another position. There's a, a kid named Jonathan Smith who really looked great to start last year. Uh, he, w- he started as a, a true freshman and then kind of promptly got hurt, so we don't really know what we have, but there was there were flashes of really, really good football there. Dominique Ross is going to step in there as well. He had some good moments. But I would say as between the defensive line, the defensive backs, and the linebackers, the linebackers have the least depth, and that's the the point of greatest concern. Last one for you here. Getting into the schedule, no Florida State, no Clemson. UNC gets Louisville at home week two. What's your outlook for North Carolina in 2017, and would going to a bowl game be a good season for this program? Yeah, I, th- I think I would more say that if they don't go to a bowl, that's a disappointing season. There are some games on the schedule that you sort of have a hard time seeing how they win. I think Miami is going to be a tough out for them if they live up to their recruiting level. But my expectation for North Carolina is that they're going to be better than people think. I would predict about an eight-win season for them. I think that that Louisville game that you mentioned is – uh, maybe a bellwether for the year. Obviously, they have Lamar Smith, and that's a pretty good piece to start with. I don't know what else they have, but I think that you'll learn a lot about what North Carolina's season is going to be like. Even if they lose that game, how do they look? Are they competitive, or do they look like they're they're playing catch-up? That and The other thing about that is when you're defending the returning Heisman Trophy winner, you're going to find out something about your defense and whether they're able to step up and do what you need them to do to, to have the kind of season they want. So my guess is that most of the press will pick North Carolina to be in the bottom half of the Coastal. I'm going to guess they'll say around six wins, and my guess is that it will be eight or better. Well, it certainly should be a lot of fun watching North Carolina this year. A lot of new faces. I know that I'm rooting for Brandon Harris. He's a good kid, and I'd like to see him succeed in that job. And you certainly won't hear me say anything bad about Larry Fedora for fear that he will find me and absolutely whoop my ass. <laughs> he, he he could do it. I mean, he, he's, a, he's a monster, yeah. man. I feel like that dude could punch me into outer space if he wanted to. But if you want to keep up with anything UNC football, you can do so, and you should do so by going to TarHeelBlog.com and following them on Twitter at TarHeelBlog. And, of course, you can find all of Jay's work on Tar Heel Blog, and you should follow him on Twitter. He is at Barry, me, and Keenan. Jay, thanks for uh, hopping on the show and talking North Carolina. I appreciate it. I really enjoyed it, Colton. Please have me back sometime. Absolutely. Like I said, Larry Fedora is not a dude that I want to mess with. That's a tough son of a bitch right there. I um, want to say thank you again to Jay Exum for joining the show. Follow him on Twitter at Barry Me in Keenan, and make sure to visit Tar Heel Blog, TarHeelBlog.com, and find them on Twitter at Tar Heel Blog. I gotta admit, I was pretty unoptimistic about North Carolina heading into that interview, but I think that Jay made a lot of points. And what he said about the offense made a lot of sense that even though there's new faces, Larry Fedora has produced pretty much everywhere that he's been. And I do think that being in the Coastal kind of gives them an added advantage, maybe, that they don't have to play at a high level to start the season right away. They can kind of build up with those new faces and get into a groove And I I do think that they found good footing with Larry Fedora as the leader of that program in Chapel Hill. So definitely intrigued to watch what North Carolina does this season with so many new faces. I I think that there's going to be growing pains and there's going to be fits and starts. But if Brandon Harris is able to live up to some of that potential that he showcased heading into college, then I, I think that the offense certainly will be there will be less to worry about with what they do in the passing game. And then defensively, like we talked about, you figure that there's going to be more than one interception. They're going to be able to create some turnovers. And if they just get solid defensive play, then they're going to be able to score points and win some games. So I think seven, eight wins 
would be a pretty good season for North Carolina this year. That's going to wrap up this show. want to thank everybody for listening. Make sure you go to soundcloud.com slash two stripes pod to find all the old shows there. You can listen to this one there and head over to iTunes, search the two stripes podcast, subscribe, leave a review, leave a comment, leave some feedback for me about how I can make this show better. I'm stoked as hell that we're 25 episodes into this thing and people seem to be liking it. The subscriptions have gone up. So thank you if you are subscribed. I really appreciate it. And want to continue to build this thing with you guys as we head into fall camp and into the 2017 season. I'm really enjoying putting these podcasts out and I hope that you're all enjoying listening to them. I'm having a real blast doing these right now and I hope that that's infectious and that you guys feel that and you're enjoying the show. I'll be back later this week for another episode, another preview of the 2017 season. But until then, I want to thank you for listening. My name is Colton Denning and this is the Two Stripes Podcast.